Good, okay, thanks. So I am very happy today to introduce today's speaker. Uh, Amy Smythe has dedicated her career to serving the aging population and supporting family caregivers. With over 20 years of experience in aging services, Amy's passion is to positively shape the way society views and supports older adults and to make a lasting difference in the lives of elders and their families. She is the founder and owner of Honor Aging Coaching and Consulting and holds a master's degree in gerontology. She's a certified senior advisor and has a certificate in spiritual gerontology. And we're very happy to have her and her husband Barry with us this morning. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning. I'm so honored to be here with you all and such a warm welcome. I appreciate that the spirit really is in this place and it's beautiful to be able to join you this morning. I do want to honor uh, Chris and Julie who are members here and they introduced me to Deborah um, who and I met Chris and Julie on a hike and then they became my pickleball partners. So that's that's how I got connected with you all this morning. So about 10 years ago, I am sitting at my dining room table with my my grandmother and we're watching the birds out at the feeder. There's this quiet lull in our conversation as we sat enjoying nature and each other's presence. And in the space of that silence, my grandma asked, why am I still here? And this question is the reason why I'm doing this today. It's the reason why I launched our company. It's the question that drives me to want to continue to restore the honor of elderhood. You see, my grandma was in her mid nineties at the time that she asked this question. To me, she was a great example of adaptive aging. Um, when she could no longer live in her two story condo, she moved from her home state of Michigan here to La Crosse, Wisconsin to be closer to my mom, her eldest daughter. When she no longer felt safe driving, even in the city here, she voluntarily gave up her car. And when and she, she's the one that made the decision to move to assisted living. Um, and mostly that was because she just didn't want to cook for herself anymore. Having lived in 99 years of age, she was still emailing us each morning, keeping up with her friends on Facebook and doing her shopping online. So as you can see, this is a, a, a great picture of adaptive aging, yet even she wondered what her purpose was in elderhood. This morning, I wanna share with you the current state of elderhood in our country, why it matters to all of us, and how we can change this trajectory from this anti-aging society that we live in uh, to one that honors elders again, one person at a time. So next slide. There's some powerful work factors at work in our country. First, there's been this incredible increase in life expectancy. At the start of the 20th century, life expectancy in the US was 47 years old. Today, it's around 77. And for those who are already 65, a majority will live into their 80s and quite possibly beyond. Secondly, we have the baby boomers. This generation has transformed every life stage that they've lived through. As they become today's modern elders, they also can rewrite what it looks like to, to honor aging and to um, honor elderhood. So with the increasing longevity, the aging of this massive boomer population, in addition to the declining fertility rates, for the first time in history, there'll be more older adults than children. Now, this impacts nearly every institution uh, in our society, workplaces, homes, the media, more. All these systems and institutions must evolve to meet this new age of aging. Next slide. But the interesting dichotomy is with, with this, we have this new reality of an aging population, but we're still very much an anti-aging culture. But America wasn't always this way. I wanna highlight just one factor as an example of how the honor of elderhood declined in our country. And that's the industrial revolution. While the Industrial Revolution indeed revolutionized America, 
one of the adverse effects it had was on our view of elderhood. There was this massive reorganization of our daily lives. Um, there was this shift from rural to urban areas, which resulted in families being spread out. And this disrupted the social systems that were once in place, making it more difficult for elders to rely on families for assistance. In rural areas that were largely uh, revolving around agriculture, knowledge was passed on from one generation to the next. The elders were needed and respected for that knowledge. But with the rise of factories, youth became more highly valued for their vigor and ability to maintain long hours and difficult work conditions. So no longer were elders a source of wisdom and knowledge for this new type of work. So the Industrial Revolution is just one factor, but it really helped influence the trajectory of the culture we find ourselves living in, this culture that's obsessed with anti-aging. Now, I like a good skin product as much as anyone, but the fact that in 2020, the anti-aging products market was estimated at $14.2 billion is quite telling. And it's more than just cosmetic. You know, anti-aging spills into ageism in the workplace, um, and the way we talk about aging is something to be feared and avoided at all costs. And at best, we think we're honoring our elders when we refer to them as cute. I love this quote by Louise Aronson from her book, Elderhood. We prize youth, though doing so means that all of us will spend most of our lives in a state of failure. Next slide, please. I see the restoration of vibrant elderhood as a justice movement. We all benefit from the elders in our communities, whether we know it or not. Elders provide guidance and mentorship to younger generations. They've lived through what we're living through now. It might look a little bit different, but they're a better source of wisdom than Google. Elders provide tremendous family support. Um, US data, census data shows that 7.1 million American grandparents are living with their grandchildren under 18 and some 2.3 million of those grandparents are responsible for their grandchildren. Baby boomers have the highest volunteerism rate of any generation, and, and over a quarter of the silent generation, the generation above the boomers, still has a rate of 25% volunteerism. It's estimated that boomers contributed $58.6 billion to nonprofits last year. So I share these tidbits to reinforce that our elders are a powerful force in our society. We need them. With the booming elder population, now is the time to restore elderhood in our country. We have an opportunity to change attitudes to one that celebrates and honors elderhood. So let's shift away from looking at the, the really big picture and bring it down to, to you and me. Let's look at one way we can help each other explore the possibilities that can make elderhood their most meaningful season. Next slide, please. So what I'm introducing to you today is just one tool to help us move away from a survival mode way of responding to situations into a more expansive and thoughtful approach to life, and in this case, elderhood. So let's start by reminding ourselves of our brains and how they work. The left brain is very good at assessing our current reality, of scanning through these mental files of what information I have or what I need to move forward. However, our thinking is limited by our past experience and our current understanding. We can search for more information from outside sources, or we can switch our brains to creativity mode. Now the right brain is where we access joy. And joy helps us flip the switch into a relational mindset, wherein we become connected to something bigger than ourselves and bigger than what our current experience is. Next slide, please. So why focus on joy? Joy makes us want to play. It expands our curiosity and fosters our connection with others. In the book, Joy Starts Here, James Wilder writes, from the moment we are born, joy shapes the chemistry, structure, and growth of our brain. Joy lays the foundation of how well we will handle relationships, emotion, pain, and pleasure throughout our lifetime. Joy creates an identity that is stable and consistent over time. Joy gives us the freedom to share our hearts with God and others. Expressing our joyful identity creates space for others to belong. Joy gives us the freedom to live without masks because in spite of our weaknesses, we know that we're loved. 
We're not afraid of our vulnerabilities or exposure. Joy gives us the freedom from fear to live from the heart that Jesus gave us. We discover increasingly, increasing delight in becoming the people God knew we could be. And my favorite thing about joy is that it cultivates hope in us. Aging can be emotionally taxing. There's so many changes that we're forced to adapt to over and over and over. Michael Hendricks in the other half of church says, trying to do emotionally taxing work with an empty tank is like, trying, is like running a marathon without having eaten food for a month. I've worked with many elders who are trying to make these adaptations over and over on an empty tank. And how did they get this empty tank? A uh, lot of it is they, they didn't want to think about growing old. They didn't want to talk about it. They avoided any discussions about it, which ultimately led to a crisis where they were forced to address an issue. Or they just didn't have it in them to make yet another change, even a good one that would allow them to continue living where and how they wanted to. So their choice was then taken away from them. Yet another loss. On the other hand, uh, I attended a memorial service this past week for a woman who had been confined to her bed for over five years due to severe osteoporosis. Her body was frail, but her spirit was strong and her joy was full. I saw her about a month before she passed and she was encouraging me. Talking with her family, she told them, I jump over my pain with joy. I jump over my pain with joy. That's how powerful joy can be in our lives. Next slide, please. So gratitude, so how can we grow our joy capacity so that we're planning our future from a place of possibility and hope rather than relying on limited past experience that might not serve our future? Well, gratitude is the first step to building more joy in our lives, but perhaps not gratitude in the way that you've been taught. Gratitude's always a good practice, but there's a gratitude practice that activates our left brain, and that's verbal gratitude. Like, I'm so grateful to be with you all day. I'm so grateful to live in this beautiful area. That's, that's all good practice, but it's, it's left brain. There's, then there's nonverbal gratitude. So nonverbal gratitude is right brain. No words are necessary, just memories but it's important for each of these memories to have two characteristics. The first is the memory is such that we are aware of the sensations in our bodies as we relive it. And the second is that the memory is relational. We feel some connection with people, other people or God or something bigger than ourselves. These two characteristics ensure that my right brain stays involved in this practice. So why is that important? Because again, building joy is a right brain dominant exercise. So when I started this practice of building my own joy capacity, here's what it looked like for me. So sitting quietly, I just opened myself up with the intention of wanting to connect with a, a joy filled memory. And I was surprised that the memory that came to mind was actually when I was uh, nine or 10 years old. And I was at summer camp sitting around a campfire with a lot of other campers and counselors. And it was one of those beautiful summer nights here in Southwest Wisconsin where this, you know, the sky was just wild with stars and it was just beautiful night. And I didn't really know God then, but in that moment, I felt connected with every person around me and connected to something greater than myself. I felt awe and wonder like anything was possible. I can remember the song we were singing. And even as I share this memory with you, I, that feeling again is welling up in me. That's how powerful this practice can be. And as I practice this memory, it nurtures joy in me just like it did during the actual experience. It grows my joy capacity. And there's no words that I'm using when I'm experiencing that memory. I'm simply settling into it and experiencing it again and again. I, I would encourage you all to start your own bank of joy memories. As they come to you, just give them a little title that will remind you of the moment. Like for me, this was Sugar Creek Campfire. When I see that on a piece of paper, and I'm practicing my joy, building my joy, I just see that and it takes me back right there to that memory. You can take time with your list 
and like five minutes a day and just enjoy those memories, enjoy the feeling that it inspired in you and it increases your own joy capacity, which serves you well, no matter your age. Next slide, please. So this is a coaching tool that we use in our business. Instead of goals-based planning, we focus on possibility-based planning with joy being the connection that gets us there. Oftentimes I'm working with families in a moment of crisis and stress or people who have tried all the things and don't know what to do next. Sure, I can throw out options for them, but I found it's more helpful to pull back a moment and get them more engaged in the process because at this moment their tank is on empty. So for example, working with an adult child who is stressed about their parents' choices or their unwillingness to make changes. I'll give them a few minutes to share with me the reality of their situation as they see it. Maybe it's they don't think mom or dad should be living it in their home anymore, that it's not safe. But before they go on and on and on in their frustration, I might ask them to take a deep breath and think of a time that they really enjoyed their parent. Before even sharing that memory with me, I'll just ask them to sit and connect with it. Just sit with that memory for a moment. And you can literally see their faces change and soften. They've connected with joy around that memory. And then their tank isn't empty anymore. It's been filled with a little joy. And now the creative juices are flowing a bit. It's from that place that we can possibility plan. I worked with a client recently who was worried about their physical health and how it would impact their, their aging experience. And when they shared with me the current reality, it sounded something like this. I should be able to fill in the blank. They compared themselves to others their age who are more physically fit and active and, and doing more physically demanding things with their bodies. This client sounded a little hopeless to me. After taking time to connect with joy through the exercise I just shared with you, the client recognized that they didn't really even have a, do, a desire to do the things that they had been comparing themselves to with these other people. Yet they were stuck in a way of thinking that caused them to dismiss doing anything about their health because they couldn't do what these other people were doing. They started identifying things that they, they wanted to do and not what they thought they should be doing. The client felt really good about the possibilities that they identified. What they actually did was they began to honor their own aging journey. So as a further example or something you can try for yourself or if you'd like with somebody else in your life, this is just, I just kind of mapped out what this, this process kind of looks like. And these are three common areas that people um, typically get stuck in or overwhelmed. Their physical health, finding meaning in their lives and their contributions to the world and their spiritual lives. So again, I'll start by having them name their current reality, although that's the easy part. That's usually why they've reached out. Then we move to connecting with that memory, the time they felt joy. And honestly, it doesn't even have to be connected. That, that joy memory doesn't even have to be connected to what area that they're struggling in. We, the point is to move people to a place where they feel connected to joy. And from this place, when they've activated their right brain and fueled their creative juices, now we're ready to explore the possibilities that bring hope. So it's just a quick overview of this tool. And for those of you who might study this for a living and are certainly smarter than I am, please forgive my oversimplification. But if you're interested in learning more about this topic, I have included some resources at the end. Um, next slide, please. So in closing, we have an amazing opportunity at this time to shift our view of aging. What we've been doing isn't making the changes we need to, and it's, it's time to do things differently. Again, Louise Aronson wrote, revolution occurs when enough people accept that the current paradigm is inadequate and reject it in favor of a new one. Or as my husband Barry says, join the joyful elder revolution. <laughs> I wanna challenge those of you who are over 65 to examine your own beliefs about aging, and maybe even try our joy tool to explore new possibilities. And for those of you who are younger, I challenge you also to explore your beliefs about aging and ask yourself how you can better honor the elders in your life. You see, I'm just joy-filled enough to believe that we can form a new paradigm of aging that rejects the anti-aging nonsense and embraces a vibrant elderhood, where an elders feel the freedom to explore the possibilities of their elderhood 
and that elderhood becomes an honored and meaningful season in their lives when they will know why they are still here. So we're not giving up. How could we? Even though on the outside, it looks like things are falling apart on us, the inside where God is making new life, not a day goes by with that unfolding grace. It's my prayer for that we would all continue to connect with joy in our lives, and especially as we are planning for our future. Thank you.